So in many scenarios, we're often interested in the behavior of a sum of random variables, which is also a random variable. We're going to denote that by s of n, which is the sum of x1 up to xn. So for instance, maybe we're computing the sample mean, which we write as mu hat of x or mn. Okay, and that's just the average of random variables x1 up to xn. The reason we use that is just to estimate the mean from data. Okay, so how many samples or how much data do we need to get a good estimate? And we'll say a bit more later about what this means precisely, but ideally we would get our precise answers using the PMF or PDF of the sum of random variables itself. Okay, so if we had that, we could work this out pretty accurately. Unfortunately, calculating that exact PMF or PDF is quite difficult, even in simple scenarios. So say I assume that the random variables are independent and I want the PMF or PDF for their sum, I need to do n convolution operations to get that PMF or PDF. And you can see why that gets pretty challenging right away. As a starting point, instead of getting the full distribution, let's just see how to calculate the mean and variance of a sum of random variables. Okay, so again, we're going to write the sum as Sn, which is x1 plus x2 up to xn. The mean of the sum I can just get by linear expectation by pushing the expectation into the sum. That's it. The variance turns out to be uh, the variance of a linear transformation, but let's work out the details just to be clear. So I just write Sn minus its mean squared and average it. I'm going to expand that out in terms of the sum, okay? And then I'm going to um, notice that I can pull the sum out of both of these and just put them together. And now I'm going to use this very special fact that I can write the square of a summation as a double summation. So for instance, if I have the sum of ai from 1 to n and I square that sum, I could just as well have written the sum from i equals 1 to n and j equals 1 to n, ai times aj. So these two things are the same. And I can just use that here, treating a as x minus its mean. Okay, so I'm just using that fact here and opening this up. Use the linearity of expectation again to push the e inside the double summation. And I'm going to notice that now what I have here inside the sum is just the covariance between xi and xj. Okay, so I have the sum over i and the sum over j covariance of xi, xj. And so that I can just calculate using pairwise uh, second order statistics. And that's pretty easy to get both in practice and uh, with pen and paper. Again, to make things even simpler, so to simplify these quantities even further, we usually make additional assumptions on our random variables. Okay, and one um, particular set of assumptions that we make on these random variables is that the random variables x1, x2 up to xn are said to be independent and identically distributed, often shortened as iid, if the random variables are independent, that makes sense, and the identically distributed part is that they have the same underlying marginal distribution, which is the PMF in the discrete case and the PDF in the continuous case. And that means for every single random variable, when I go to look up its marginal PMF or marginal PDF, I get the same function. I might just be plugging in different values for each of those random variables, but I'm plugging them into the same function for the marginal PMF. So this Xi, in the subscript became just x. So overall in the discrete case, what this means is that when I go to write the joint PMF, I write it as the product of the marginals. All the marginals are the same function. I'm just plugging in different values. I can just write it as the product of this marginal and times plugging in different values. The same thing for the continuous case, except I'm just doing it with a PDF, just taking the product of the same function, f of x, plugging in the xi. As in two examples, let's do a discrete and a continuous example. In the discrete case, let's say what we have are n iid, so independent and identically distributed Bernoulli p random variables. The Bernoulli pmf I can just write in the simple form, p of the x, 1 minus p of the 1 minus x, 
you can quickly convince yourself that if I plug in x equals zero here, I'm going to get one minus p from that. If I plug in x equals one, I'm going to get p, which is what I wanted. So then if I go to write the joint PMF, I'm going to use the formula that I, that I just worked out, which is that I can write the product of the marginal PMF plugging in the xi. Okay, and just lifting this product into the exponent, I get the sum of the xi here, and then n minus the sum of the xi here. Okay, so I get this rather simple form for a joint PMF. All right, and for a the continuous case, let's say the random variables are iid Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared. So I can write down the PDF, marginal PDF for a Gaussian with those statistics. It's going to be 2 pi sigma squared and the uh, root of the denominator. And then I have this exponent as usual. So when I go to write the joint PDF, what I'm going to do is take the product, this function n times, but for each of the um, entries, I'm going to plug in a different value for xi. So I'm going to have 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared, exponent of minus 1 over 2 sigma squared, uh, square of xi minus mu. Okay, and so moving the product into the exponent, I get this constant term up front, and then e to the minus 1 over 2 sigma squared, sum of xi minus mu squared. Okay. So let's see how this IID assumption lets us simplify the mean and variance of a sum of random variables. Okay, so the sum of IID random variables has mean, which I can just write as n times e of x, which is the mean of the marginal. The variance is just the variance, of the sum, which is n times the variance of the marginal. Okay, so those quantities I calculate using the marginal of one of the random variables. Why is this true? Well, because of linear expectation, I can push e into the sum. And then because things are identically distributed, all of these have the same mean. And so I just get n times e of x. Okay, the same kind of thing is going to work for the variance. I write the double summation of the covariances. This time I'm going to break out um, the terms where j is equal to i and j is not equal to i. I'm going to notice that by independence, these are zero. And so I'm just left with the sum of variances because covariance of xi and xi is just variance of xi. And so that's just n times the variance of x because they all have the same variance. They're identically distributed. So now with these facts in hand, I can work out the mean and variance of the sample mean, which is just the average of random variables. So when those are iid, I have very simple formulas uh, for both the mean and the variance. So for the mean of the sample mean, I have just e of x. And that's because this 1 over n term will cancel out the n. For the variance, I have the variance of this 1 over n times the sum, which is 1 over n times the variance. Why does that happen? Well, just as I said, you can pull the 1 over n out here and it cancels out with the n that we got from the mean of the sum. Okay, And for the variance, I can pull the 1 over n out, I get 1 over n squared. And that partially cancels out the n that I'm going to get from the variance of the sum, okay? So I get 1 over n times the variance of the sum, or just the variance. The key thing here is to notice that in the sample mean, I'm getting the average, which is the true mean, so it's an unbiased estimate of the true mean, and its variance is going to zero as n goes up. So it's getting to be less and less um, variable around that mean, so I'm getting a better and better estimate. So finally, let's put our techniques to use to understand this sample variance sigma hat squared or v of n, which we've seen before, which is used to calculate an estimate for the variance from data. So the way that we usually write this is just v of n is 1 over n minus 1, summing up xi minus the sample mean squared, where the sample mean is just 1 over n times the sum of the xi. So why are we multiplying here by 1 over n minus 1 instead of 1 over n? Well, Let's just try 1 over n and see what happens. Okay, so I'm just replacing 1 over n minus 1 with 1 over n. Here I'm kind of using something that looks like the alternate variance formula. You can work this out for yourself. So what I've done is I've replaced um, the sum over xi minus mn squared with just sum over xi squared minus mn squared. And that should remind you of the alternate variance formula. 
So let's calculate the mean of this new estimator. Is it the variance of x? We'll see. Well, the mean, I can just plug in the um, estimator here, and I'm going to use linear of expectation to push the expectation inside. So I get expectation of xi squared minus expectation of mn squared. I'm going to use the alternate variance formula to write this as variance of x plus square of e of x minus variance of mn minus uh, square of e of mn. Okay, so these terms I know, and the variance of mn I know to be 1 over n times the variance of x, and its mean I know to be e of x. So now I see that these e of x terms cancel. With the variance though, I end up with n minus 1 over n, variance of x, and so this is not a, an unbiased estimator, it's actually biased because its average is a constant factor times the true variance. I want it to just be equal to the true variance. And using that 1 over n minus 1 factor corrects this exactly. Okay, so then I get away from this issue and I get an estimator v of n which has expectation variance of x just like I wanted. Okay. And intuitively, the reason this is actually happening is that there are correlations coming in between m, and n, m of n, which is composed of the average of the xi's, and this other sample variance estimator, which is reusing the xi's and thus introducing some correlations. But the key point is that with 1 over n minus 1, we get rid of that bias and we get a nice unbiased estimator.